All right. So between now and Tuesday, when your group project is due, you will have completed running all of your participants. You will analyze and, and write up your results, and you will create your final project documentation. That includes your final report. So what is it that you need to do for that? The thing I want you to remember is when you are writing this up, I want you to be in the mindset that you are writing this for a client. You want something that is informative, yet detailed, while still being concise, but that's easy to read. In other words, I don't want just blobs of text. Try to use things like tables, graphs, bullet points, in an appropriate manner. I also don't want an entire document that is all bullet points. That's not appropriate either. Think about if I was your paying client. So what is it that you should do? Now you've collected all your data. You should create a Word document that has your open-ended questions. Right? I want you to look at how your participants have answered those questions and you want to consolidate any important comments in this Word document. You're basically going from your notes to consolidating your separate notes of different participants into a Word document because putting them together is going to make it a lot easier for you to then write it up in your, fi in your final document. I also want you to create an Excel spreadsheet. You do have to turn in your Excel spreadsheet. Don't forget. There are groups that lose points because they don't turn in their Excel spreadsheet. So make sure you turn it in. It's a very simple mistake to make. I can't remember. I either take five or ten points off for that. I have to go look at my uh, rubric to see for sure. But I do take points off if you don't turn in your Excel file. Now, create an Excel spreadsheet. I want you to go look at the Likert scales that you have from your participants. And you are going to record those responses in your Excel spreadsheet. All right? It's in your Excel spreadsheet that you're then going to be able to take those. You're going to be able to calculate means, which is basically a measure of central tendency. We tend to think of it as the average. All right, so you do need to have averages. With some, uh, with some questions, depending on the type of question, you may want to have frequencies. So, you, for example, were they able to complete the task? You can say 80% of my participants completed the task. How difficult was it? Well, on a scale of 1 to 5, the mean was a 4.3. Those types of things. You will calculate those in Excel. Excel is also where you will create graphs. To have nice graphs and nice images for your final document. Here's something I mentioned before that's really, really important. If you want a graph to be part of your final document, where do you need to put it? I hope this is obvious. Should you leave it in the Excel spreadsheet and not put it anywhere else? PowerPoint? <laughs> well, you can put it in your PowerPoint if it's part of your presentation. That's a great idea. Now, if you want it part of your final document, your final report, where should you put, also put it? Word. In Word in your final report. I know, an amazing revelation. I can't tell you how many groups forget. And they'll even refer to it, as can be seen in figure X. Figure X. There's no figures in here. As a client, am I going to go searching through your Excel spreadsheet for your graph? No. In fact, you probably would not even give that Excel spreadsheet to a client in a situation like this. So make sure, if you want it, something in your final document, you need to actually put it in your final document.
Now, when you are analyzing your results, you're going to look at your means, you're going to look at your frequencies, and you're going to eye, essentially eyeball the data. And you want to talk about what it is that you're finding. So, if three out of five of your participants completed the task, then you state three out of five of your participants completed the task. Now, what's something that you can say about that? Well, you can say something like, okay, you know, three, three out of five of the participants were able to complete the task. So, clearly, this was not an, a very easy task. It seemed to have a moderate amount of difficulty for some participants. Now, that's very different from making a statement that is some big, sweeping, statistical conclusion when we have such a small sample size. You don't want to generalize to the general population. You want to focus on your participants. It may indicate that there would be an overall issue with the general population, but it is not proof, one, because in the scientific, even if this was scientific in science, you don't prove things. You either provide evidence or you disprove. And two, we have a small end count. You, you're going to have five. You can't make any generalized conclusions about that. You can find errors. All right, focus on the problems that were uncovered. Right, those are the things that are really, really interesting. Now, of course, you want to mention those things that worked well. Because it is a good thing when you have things that work well in a product, correct? You want to make sure you also discuss that. But usually you have more to talk about when there is a problem that you have uncovered. When you have uncovered a problem, you can do things like suggest ways of fixing it. Or if it's not clear how it can be fixed, then you can suggest some alternatives and suggest that perhaps you need some more detailed research to know which possible solution is going to work best. I want to see that you're actually thinking about what you found. Now, all of these details you're going to be talking about in your, result, in your results. I will show you the different components of, of the paper really quick. One component I want to mention really quick, because students always have difficulty with this, is you're going to have the body of your report. Before you get to the body of your report, you're going to have something called an executive summary. Have any of you seen an executive summary before? No? Do I get one? Yes? No. OK. If you go to a lot of reports, you will find that there's a nice long body that has details about what, is this, what was the study about, what was the methodology, what was done, what were the results, what are the conclusions, what are our recommendations. It can be anywhere from, I don't know, five, usually longer, five to 40 pages long. Yours is not going to be 40 pages long, by the way. It's more of the professional ones are 40 pages long. At the beginning of those, you'll see a one to two page summary that's called an executive summary. The executive summary takes essentially the information that is in the body of your report and it makes it very concise and summarizes it. It does not include a lot of details. It tells you generally what the study is about, what was done, what was found, what conclusions were made. Typically, for this class, it will be half to three quarters of a page. And it's a summary that goes before the body of your report. Here's some mistakes that other groups have made in the past that I don't want you to make. One, they think the executive summary is the report. It is not. It is a summary. I've had groups where they, they'll create an executive summary and then they'll just take all the documents that they took notes on and they attach it to the back end. What do you think is going to happen if you do that? What do you think you're going to get? Very low score. That won't be a zero. I'll give you credit for an executive summary. Yes, I'll be like, was it Nero? Just like that. So remember, the executive summary is exactly that. It's a summary. 
right? It is not the body of the report. Another mistake, a five-page executive summary. Guess what? That's not a summary. Make sure it is concise. So remember, summary, body of the paper. Make sense? <clears throat> now, you want to make sure that you, you talk about what, we were, what you were doing in the project. Now, how do I want you to word this? This is really important. Let me tell you what I don't want you to say. I don't want you to say, well, you know, yeah, we decided to do, the, do this report because Dr. Davis, my HCI professor, told me that we had to. Very exciting. What do you think I want you to say instead, if I want you to write this as if you were writing to a client? Anybody? Boy, I thought I had quite, I thought I had quite classes before this. You guys are, I think, the quietest ever. All right, I want you to present this as if you were hired by the company that owns the product that you evaluated. All right, so if you are evaluating a smartphone, I want you to write as if the smartphone company is your client. Make sense? Yes? So please don't say this is for class. I want you to practice as if you are writing for a client out in the real world. Now, after your introduction, right, you talk about what the study is about, what the product is about, that's relatively short. You are going to be talking about what's called your methodology, where you're going to talk about what it is that you did. What activities were performed on the day of the test? So that needs to include details such as what was the environment and those sorts of things. Now, part of the activities that you engaged in that you don't have to explicitly mention, I have listed here. So things you, you, you did on the day of the test, well, you collected data. Obviously, you, you're talking about what was done. You summarized your data and you organized your materials. You don't have to explicitly state, after you talk about everything that was done, all right, then I took notes and I summarized the data and I organized my materials. What we want to know is, what did the participants experience? Make sense? Now. You are also going to have some follow-up activities, right? We already talked about things you have to do. You have to look at your data. You're going to be analyzing it. You may be categorizing data, those sorts of things. You're going to have both qualitative and quantitative data, correct? Remember the difference? I hope that's a yes. I know it's been several weeks. But by the way, that makes an awesome exam question. Did I mention that when we talked about qualitative and quantitative data? I think I did. Awesome question. I'll think about that. I haven't made your final exam yet. Now, in this case, although it's okay to mention, yeah, we did categorizing and we analyzed things, what I really want to know, what are your actual results that result from your follow-up activities? That's what I want to know in your results section. Now, the results section and the discussion is always where students have the most difficulty. So let me go through some tips that I like to give students when it comes to helping you organize that and to have something that is more cohesive and makes more sense. What are some of the things that you can talk about? Of course, we already talked about organizing things, eyeballing your data, getting means, those sorts of things. Some of the things that you want to make sure you do are some things that we talked about are important earlier on in the semester. So when you're identifying problems, you want to look at things, and you can go back to some of your notes. What is the severity of the problem? How serious is it? Is it a serious problem, or is it one that's not so serious? Right? How often does it happen? Is it something that happened to all of your participants? 
or only one of your participants. That can make a difference in terms of whether that fix is going to be prioritized as high priority or low priority. And here's another one that students tend to forget. And actually, professionals tend to forget. They're called errors of omission. Anyone want to take a guess as to what that is? When you forget about important details. Now, errors of omission, a lot of times we talk about errors of omission in your actual report. That's a problem. But errors of omission actually happen when you are developing products all the time. So the most common example of an error of omission is when you design, for example, a web page. And you forget to include a very important step or a very critical piece of information. One example is, let's say you're developing an e-commerce site. Right? You ask the person to input their, their uh, payment information and then hit pay, but they don't get to review the status of their order before they have to pay. Think that's a problem? It is. You're going to have a lot of people abandoning their carts. That would be an example of an error of omission. Something that's easy for us to forget because we don't see it, because it's not there, until you're the user and there's something that goes wrong. You want to make sure you prioritize your problem. Talk about the reasons why you think it may be a problem. Look at your data and see if that gives you any hints. Provide some potential solutions. And remember, as I said before, do identify those things that work well. Identify areas of success. And again, this is a question I get all the time. If you're not sure, if you have conflicting results, you can talk about how it is an area of uncertainty that you received conflicting results, further research is needed. But by the way, don't use that as a cop-out because you don't want to really think about things. I want to be able to see that there actually is a conflict. So don't think, oh gosh, we're running out of time. I'll just say we're not sure. 